Good morning and welcome to this seminar about uh, European Strategic Compass. My name is Karsten Fris and I will be uh, hosting this event. We're doing this, uh, this uh, webinar in cooperation with the German Council of Foreign, uh, Foreign Relations. And, and uh, the topic is, as I mentioned, the, the, the European Union Strategic Compass. Now, strategic and European Union, if you're cynic, might be a contradiction in terms. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there's a lot of things happened on the security side when it comes to European Union over the last few years uh, since since the, the adoption of the of the strategic uh, document a few years ago. Uh, and, and there's been a lot of going on on defense side as well. And, and, and so there, there's a lot of things happening. But the Norwegian audience is, I think, is not too much aware of it. And as a European country, very close to the European Union, we should we should uh, we should be aware and we should pay attention, and uh, we should maybe uh, try to influence. We will see if it's possible. I have two great uh, colleagues from the German Council of Foreign Relations to present uh, and introduce to you uh, the Compass and the work on the Compass, uh, which is going on right now. Um, so they will talk for about 10-15 minutes each, and then we will open for a Q and A. So I have I have Florian Schimmel. She is a research fellow uh, at uh, on security and defense uh, at the DGAP, and Kristen Mölling, who is a re the research director. And Florian will speak first, but I will quickly now uh, let them let you just uh, give a chance to, to to see them. So Florian, there we are. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Also from my side. Good to be back in Oslo, even if it's virtual. <laughs> Yes, that's, uh, that's again nice to, nice to see you. And uh, next time you will certainly do it uh, do it on the physical in the physical world. But this is fine. So again, um, we will kick off with with Florence. You will give us a presentation. We will go straight to Christian then afterwards, and and then I will open for for Q and A. So we will uh, have a slide here, and uh, Florence, the floor is yours. Thank you, Karsten. Thank you for the lovely introduction and also thank you for the kind invitation. Both Christian and I are very happy to be here today and talk about the European Union Strategic Compass. And we're also very interested um, to hear what you think about it and um, today to have the Q&A and discussion. As Karsten uh, said in this introduction, we're going to talk about the European Union Strategic Compass and why Norway as an on-member should care about it. And um, to give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk about, um, let me please introduce you our, to our guiding questions um, so you know what to expect uh, during this input. The first is, why should Norway care? Karsten already alluded to some of the, the reasons why as a non-member it might still be interesting, but um, maybe I can add a bit to that. Then I'll talk about why the European Union decided to launch this initiative of the Strategic Compass and then after that, I will talk about what the Strategic Compass is really about. So what what, what contains the, the, the word, <laughs> what is meant by it. And since this is a process, um, we will talk about what has happened already so far, what the status quo is at the moment and what is yet to come. Then Christian is going to take over and provide you with some wider context and small spoiler alert. Um, he's going to be talking about NATO, for example. And um, he's going to show um, how the European Union Strategic Compass could improve things and then talk about what challenges could come with such progress. And then to sort of finish our conversation and kick off the question and answers and the discussion, we will um, raise the question, what role could be there for Norway? Why should Norway care? about the European Union uh, initiative. As Karsten said, um, it has uh, implications for the European security architecture. We put in the word potential because um, there is some jitters all about that is a paper tiger because the, the um, strategic compass is going to be a strategic document. So it could be um, a paper exercise that does not translate in reality. Uh, no one wants that, but this is one of the one of the risks, obviously. But if it does work, um, there is uh, some evolution to be expected in the European security architecture, which will have implications for Norway too. This also presents an opportunity to increase coherence with NATO processes, uh, which is of course of um, high relevance to Norway. I am not going to talk more about this here because uh, Christian will elaborate on that later and show how this might be a once in a decade or maybe once in two decades opportunity. 
to link these processes up. As Norway is already closely linked to the EU common security and defense policy, so the CSDP, um, what happens in the strategic compass will influence the CSDP. Norway has in the past contributed to CSDP operations, is a major contributor to the European Defence Agency, and also has assigned forces in the past to the EU battle groups. So how the EU allocates its resources in its CSDP does matter to Norway. Also, the strategic compass has different issue areas, and one of it is defining its partnerships. Norway is an important partner to the EU, so this will certainly have some implications there. In general, the strategic compass is, as the word indicates, a strategic document and um, does define the EU's direction it is going to take in security and defence. As Norway is a close partner in many areas uh, regarding the European Union, this is of um, great relevance, how the EU might position itself regarding hybrid threats vis-a-vis -vis Russia or how, it, um, how much emphasis it puts, for example, on areas such as the Arctic um, does matter. Moreover, 21 European states are double-headed, so they are a member of the European Union and of NATO. So whatever they do in one area of defence uh, and security does have um, an impact on their second role. Also, Sweden and Finland might not be uh, such double-headed states, but they have a special role there too, because they're already closely coordinating their military planning with NATO. Um, they are involved with threat analyses and um, do uh, exercises together. So it is um, an even closer overlap here that exists. Why does the EU decide to have such uh, an undertaking and allocate so many resources into such, uh, such a process? There is a certain dualism um, that is on many levels um, and in all issue areas in the European Union as it is a transnational organization. You have an evolving European structure in security and defense on the European level, on the EU level, and then you have defense as a national domain and competence um, which is more prominent than it is um, maybe in other areas such as trade. And this dualism has to be settled all the time, which is um, which can be a struggle, which can come with opportunities, but something that certainly must be addressed. And um, the strategy that Karsten uh, alluded to in his introduction so kindly, the global strategy of 2016, did put out um, a global vision also with regards to security and defense in 2016, but there is somehow a missing link um, when it comes to the hierarchy of, of strategic documents that links it to national military planning. So the strategic compass aims to um, be more concrete on what the global strategy intends to do, so it can inform military frameworks, um, also civilian planning, and maybe the headline goals. The global strategy, just two words on, uh, on that, um, was meant to follow up the EU's economic power to increase common action in security and defense, to um, nurture its ambition for strategic autonomy and position it um, as, 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 more, as a more coherent uh, global player. So now I've talked about why it should matter to, the, to Norway and why the EU cares so much about it. Now let's finally dig into what the EU strategic compass is all about. Firstly, it's about identifying common threats. And if you allow me a quick play on words here, it's not about only identifying common threats, but also to commonly identify threats. This means that the EU member states um, all pool together what they think um, are the threats to come. And while the threat analysis that, was, that came out of it is not a politically agreed upon um, threat assessment, it is, um, so it is not an, an intelligence document per se, it is something that um, further uh, deliberations can be based upon and is um, a first ever for the European Union. Also, um, the European Strategic Compass is, to, is about implementation, implementing the priorities from the global strategy. So as I said earlier, it, is, um, it should condense down the very high strategic level to a bit more tangible strategic achievements and objectives. Also, um, it is about informing the level of ambition 
and derive what that what it, what is needed um, to be able to fulfill it. The discussion um, of the EU strategic compass is organized in four so-called baskets, crisis management, resilience, capabilities and partnerships. Remember partnerships, I talked about that earlier, that um, this is one of the issue areas and um, if the EU wants to manage those more strategically, that is definitely one of the implications for Norway. The baskets crisis management and resilience could be understood as a level of ambition and capabilities and partnerships as the needs to be able to fulfill such a level of ambition. They can then offer the guidance for the national planning, so the link back to the national level that I talked about earlier. All in all, this um, initiative is intended to strengthen the EU as a security actor, so there is more common action amongst the member states and more coordination and a more joined up approach to the challenges that are present today and also tomorrow. As I said, this is a process, so please allow me to um, talk about what has already happened and um, what is yet to come. In a council decision of June 2020, it was decided to launch this initiative. Um, it should define policy orientations and specific goals and objectives in the four clusters that are just uh, the, the baskets that I just talked about. And during the German EU presidency in the second half of last year, this threat assessment that I talked about was conducted and agreed upon by the member states then um, in December. Now, during the first half uh, of 2021, there's the so-called strategic dialogue under the EU presidency of Portugal. This, is this, this can be understood as an input phase where all the member states say what, they, what content they would want to see in the different baskets. So what should crisis management be about? What do we need to talk about when it comes to resilience? What kind of capabilities would we need? Which partnerships should be prioritized? And so on and so forth. Then for the second half of 2021, there is the drafting and consensus building part of this process envisioned under the Slovenian EU presidency. So that means that everything is compiled and now the nitty gritty starts of how can we um, use the right words to formulate this so all of the 27 member states <laughs> can agree on this without being too wishy-washy, without um, losing um, the, the edge of it. So this is definitely going to be going to be a challenge. And then for now, the plan is that in the first half of 2022, um, the strategic compass can be presented under the French EU presidency. The French will have elections in um, spring of 2022. So this will definitely um, play a role there. They will want to um, be able to present this product and say, yes, this is finished. This is something we did, um, which is why this timeline is probably going to hold. At the moment, um, we are in the strategic dialogue phase. So uh, the, the input phase where all the member states uh, flag their priorities and interests and start um, to come together. We hope that the timeline will hold. We will see whether that works. And um, right now I will give over the word um, to Christian because this timeline is um, it comes at a very opportune moment, so to speak, when talking about wider context. Yes, thank you very much, Florence. And thanks for putting on the next slide. Indeed, let's try and put this into a wider context because so far you could argue sitting in Oslo, uh, okay, this sounds like a typical EU process, very much navel gazing, developing institutions, documents, etc. What, what, what does it change? I mean, what has changed is the world outside and the European Union has taken note of that um, with all its responses towards Russia, China, et cetera, et cetera, which are partly still in the making. Um, getting closer to Brussels, um, there's another institution, which is NATO, which is running a partly parallel process. And we have, a, as Florence said, once in a decade or once in a two decades opportunity to synchronize processes and by that um, not only pleasing bureaucracies, but really creating an added value for the European Union as such, or for, 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 for Europe as such. So not only for the European Union and NATO, but for Europe as such. That is the important thing 
by at least on the military side possibly uh, bringing the strength of NATO and the European Union together in the way they can add to a European single set of forces. And uh, this is potentially going to happen if you take a look at the very right side of the slide uh, in the quarter one of 2023, because that's the moment um, when NATO has to start its new planning process, the NATO defense planning process, NDPP, um, with a political guidance. This is a routine thing and it has to happen. Anyway, um, the the question is whether the European Union could manage to have an EU political guidance on capability development at the same time. Um, so kind of ext extrapolating from the strategic compass towards this um, uh, this document. So there is the question of do we need a, a linking document uh, in there? However, to make this possible in 2023, uh, the kind of uh, using the opportunity to synchronize, we have to start building the coherence actually as soon as possible now because NATO is expected with its uh, with a summit in uh, in this summer to commission a new strategic concept. So a kind of a capstone document that is uh, setting the guidelines not only for a next planning cycle, but hopefully for the next decade or uh, also uh, to come. The last strategic concept was from 2010, so it doesn't accommodate any of the changes that, have, that we have seen since then. So the changes vis-a-vis -vis Russia, the changes with regard to China, or if you take a look into the other regions or topics that concern us and our security so far. So this uh, is in the making. Um, I guess the question is no longer if there is a kind of an update or uh, of the strategic concept or whatever, the question is of the quality. This is the point where kind of going side, going side to side and, and stepping, you know, in stepping up to do a parallel effort is possibly the right moment to, to kick this off now and build coherence. Um, the European Union, as Florence said, has done a threat assessment, which is also done in NATO. I expect, although these are classified, they do not differ significantly. Um, so that may provide already a, a first uh, starting ground to work from there and inform each other of what is happening to ensure that these initial steps towards 2023 are coherent, which means they at least do not contradict each other. There is even more potential if you start coordinating, taking taking language into both documents, um, and so on and so on. There, you know, this is the job of diplomats who know this much better than I do. Um, but there is a there is a big opportunity also because taking a look on the very left side, um, the 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 machinery has started to provide the micro foundation for such a coordination or coherence and synchronizing because um, the, the military staffs and the diplomats have worked on letting EU and NATO use the same set of information. So it is possible on the very uh, grassroots level, if you want to, to synchronize the two processes, or they are indeed synchronized in a way that they already use similar information for assessing capabilities, um, which is, especially if it goes to the, to the everyday work, is a key a key element because you can decide something top down, but if bottom up there is no follow up possible, um, then it basically is something that uh, that ends in in the nowhere. So this is the the window of opportunity that um, that can be filled. Uh, there is creative uncertainty, if you want to, between what is happening from uh, from 2021 to 2023 on, uh, and it's an opportunity. Next slide, please. If we talk about the opportunities now, stepping back to the to what the European Union could do and how does that this affect European security, there are four different options which are not necessarily exclusive. You, if you do one thing, you can still do the other things. It's a question of, nonetheless, where do you focus your political energy, so to say. So where do you concentrate on? What do you want to achieve? Because the time is limited uh, and the amount of energy that you could put into this is limited. The 
the option one in the left upper corner is the kind of you uh, does something for itself uh, opportunity to say so. So there's a new military level of ambition that could come out of this, with this, which is primarily related to the European Union. It would equip the European Union with a solid planning document and by that allow at least for the EU capabilities um, to have a more solid or robust capability profile afterwards, depending on what is in the document. Um, the second option on the right side is moving from the, and now we are back into the kind of institutional nitty gritty of the European Union, moving from the from the CCP pillar, so the very small crisis management, military crisis management, civilian crisis management related pillar towards EU defense. So to concentrate on making the developments that have taken a, a place not in parallel, with, but with a uh, element of coordination, to, to much stronger integrate them. So you have heard about the European uh, PESCO projects, um, about the European Defence Fund. All these things are there. They are on a test run, so to say. So the compass could also add to making to to, to breaking down the uh, the stovepipes between uh, these parallel um, projects that are somewhat linked. Uh, but still could be much more integrated and synchronized within the European Union, which would then lead towards a more an EU defense approach than a small CCP approach. Um, third opportunity is to come to a more integrated civil military or comprehensive approach, um, which is more needed than ever. Um, and I especially alluded to a comprehensive approach because it's not about only having civil and military instruments of foreign and security and defense policy being aligned. It's also about strategic elements of industry, technology, etc. that would form an appropriate comprehensive approach. That's a large endeavor, but it is something where the European Union has special skills that NATO and individual countries within the European Union and within uh, Europe do not have. So there's a kind of a an economy of scale, if you want to, if you if you pool political, industrial and technological power and kind of give it a coordination through the compass, that could be a tremendous added value. Um, and last, but definitely not least, there is the opportunity to improve EU NATO relations. That's an old topic. Um, sounds boring um, because there are stumbling blocks in it. We know about the uh, Turkey, Greece, uh, Cyprus issue, which has been there fell for 100 years and is blocking everything. And I come to a solution to that uh, in a moment. Um, but the opportunity is, I mean, at the end of the day, we have been talking about what is called the single set of forces in Europe since decades, which is in theory that the European states fill their obligations in EU and in NATO from the same pool of soldiers. So there's not an, a NATO soldier and an EU soldier. These are all soldiers of European member states or of European states. And the question is, can we make more out of the effort? And that is, of course, a question of defense and capability planning. And the, the big advantage of the European Union here is it can add the cooperation bit, because this is something that is missing in NATO. NATO is very strong in assessing capability gaps, but it is not that strong in giving indication where to go and how to how to deliver the capabilities. So NATO is not interested in how you deliver as an individual member state uh, the capabilities, where the European Union says, of course, we can help you, because the reality on the other side is that it is difficult for a single member state uh, be it EU or NATO, to deliver on the capability targets, be it EU or NATO capability targets. So the idea is, in a nutshell, to have European capability targets that are supported in their uh, fulfillment by EU and NATO and their strength. And that is something I think we could definitely do. One word on the opportunities here. Do not, and uh, being a German, I, I know the tendency of my country on that, do not build another institution we have 21 countries that are members of EU and NATO at the same time. So they are the corresponding, the corresponding uh, kind of links between the two organizations, which may informally um, have some guiding power or advisory power 
if they use it properly and wisely. And I think there is the potential of driving the processes and also possibly the potential of Norway to be uh, part of this advisory group on how to deliver more security towards Europe. Next slide. So this is the opportunity side. There's of course always a risk side to it um, or the challenges that, that come to it. And this is not a, an EU problem um, as such. It's also a NATO problem. How do you basically accommodate all the priorities that are so different? I would say the priorities are not, have not become more different um, over the last years. I think that we increasingly share uh, the risk environment because we may have talked five years ago between the threat in the east and the threat in the south, but I think this is no longer this is no longer true. If you see that uh, Russia, for example, is uh, is currently active in the south, in Libya, in in Tunisia, in parts of northern Africa, as the Chinese are, we are facing the same risk and threat environment increasingly. So there's a good deal of of putting these things together. Still, we have to see whether we can put enough resources behind it. I guess that will be the bigger the bigger challenge um, to it. And um, so, and with regard to the, the compass in the EU and also NATO, the question is still, what are the most fruitful topics that we could concentrate on? Uh, looking more towards the consensus than looking towards the dividing lines in, in, dividing lines in these things. And then it's, um, um, it's not a common, uh, common sense word to say we need to define concrete and ambitious objectives because at the end of the day, the political decision makers in all countries, so your ministers, my ministers, would have to find it attractive to put politi political capital behind this idea. Uh, and therefore, defining ambitious objectives are not only a need for security, but also for public and internal policy reasons, I'd say. Um, and then comes, of course, the question of can we implement all these things through appropriate measures? I leave that aside. Um, that is something uh, we will see once we have uh, we have delivered on the on the ambitious objectives. I would say. How, however, what is still important is to see that um, the typical battles in Brussels between the two sides, so the eastern side and the western side of the organizations, EU and NATO, is not taking over that much this, uh, uh, this endeavor. So not to have an institutional beauty contest again, but to have more uh, the ideal world of interlocking institutions where EU and NATO deliver to what the capitals want from them and what they need from them. Next slide, please. And there we are, back to Oslo. Um, so the question is, what is the role for Norway? And that is not for us to decide, um, but we wanted to trigger a little bit the discussion on your side. I, we could see four different roles Norway could take. It should, could be a bystander and say, OK, this is you inter, internal thing. Let's see how that works out. It could be an influencer, uh, try to influence one or the other development. It could be even more ask, actively be an integrator and say, OK, we want to lead this because we see added value if one or the other objective comes to life. Or it could be a cherry picker. Um, don't worry about this one. I mean, my country is a very brilliant cherry picker by at the same time giving itself always the appeal of being the European uh, uh, power, so to say, and being in favor of, of uh, taking all the, the smaller ones with us. We have national interests, but we are very good in in, uh, in smoothing them down into European interests. So uh, I think there's a legitimate way for a legitimate uh, option uh, in all the four roles, but that's happy to discuss uh, now with the audience um, and uh, see what could be the preferences. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, you're muted, Christian. Uh, I'm muted. I am muted. Because I'm sorry. There you go. Um, thank you so much, both of you, uh, Christian and Florence, for your for your overview and and your insights and your 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 reflections. Um, so let me let me start off with with posing some some questions and thoughts of you. And 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 in the meantime, I, I encourage the audience to send us your questions, and I'll try to communicate them to our experts. 
Uh, just on the first, Florence, on the on the kind of the um, the, the 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 overarching the, the the legal foundation, so to speak, of this document. I understand that this is going to be adopted by the governments, so it's going to be more formal than 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 other uh, than, for instance, the the the, the global strategy, which uh, is good in a way because that means that the governments will have to buy in the politically; they have to kind of stand by it. But on the other hand, it, it is a risk of being watered down because it has lots of compromises. Can you can you you know reflect a little bit on that, and remember to unmute yourself, like I forgot. <laughs> sure, thank you. Um, it's a good question. Yes, it's going to be um, adopted by the governments, and this presents exactly the risks that uh, that you already alluded to. Um, maybe it's a the, the threat assessment is a good um, uh, thing to illustrate this. So the threat assessment um, is not uh, a intelligence project, a, pro a product approved by all like I said, but more of a shared understanding. Still, it um, had from all the EU countries, um, civilian and military inter intelligence services contribute, pile together, um, work with the SEAC, which is the single um, intelligence analysis capacity um, on a European Union level. Um, the EU sat satellite center also contributed. Um, it, it, it brings, um, uh, ministerial levels together that maybe are not used to work together um, so much. So the, the process itself is a very good exercise in um, in, in get, learning how other ministries work in different member states on what their priorities are and what their interests are, even if the um, product that is then adopted by the government's data may, might not be as ambitious as we now want it to be. Um, it is a very important step for um, the member states to engage in such uh, in such a dialogue and, and, and to get to know more about each other, because it, as crazy as it sounds, um, this is something that has not been um, un really undertaken on such a level so far. And so um, we do have um, the uh, risk that uh, governments um, do uh, yeah, play diplomatic games or do quid pro quos with something in policy fields completely unrelated that then um, yeah, compromises the success of the strategic compass. But um, for now, um, on in the input phase, um, there's, there's a lot of exchange going on, many non-papers being circulated among the member states. So um, there is definitely a, a bit of an eagerness um, from, from the in-government experts to, to, to get closer on this, and this is, um, I think, I think uh, cautiously promising. Right. And on, on the on the process itself, um, I you said there are four baskets. That's that's understanding how to work work on these topics: the crisis management, uh, resilience, capability development, and partnerships. Are the are these going in parallel, uh, like working groups that work in parallel, or is it sequence sequential? How is it working? And 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 and. So, so yeah, a little bit curious about how they actually work and, and how to when it comes to the, the real meat of the bone, so to speak. Yes. Um, so we would have loved for them to be sequenced because it would make sense that um, the crisis management and the resilience uh, make up a level of ambition, and then you sort of derive from that um, what you need to implement, um, which capabilities and what kind of partnerships. But um, at the moment, they are worked on in parallel. And um, it also, th th this tries to accommodate that, uh, of course, the baskets are an analytical concept that help you to differentiate, but in reality, most topics and issues are not clear cut and only in one basket. Um, the best example for this is probably resilience, because resilience is all encompassing. Everything you do regarding boosting your capabilities, building them up, or um, the partnerships you have, or the crisis management missions you want to have, need to be, uh, it do have a resilience aspect to them. So it, it, it transcends that logic. But there is obviously some topics that, that you could look at that are exclusively, um, uh, can be looked at exclusively there, be like infrastructure, for example, I say, okay, I can look at that with a, with a resilience um, focus. However, these cross-cutting issues, um, we will see whether this, at the moment, working on all of these together works out. There is the so-called scoping paper in which member states presented their priorities and interests, and then this is clustered 
um, regarding to the baskets. This is a classified document that has not been made available for the public. The threat assessment um, is classified too, but there was a three pager, a sort of a clean version for the public so everyone could see what is going on, um, on, a, on, a, on a, in a general sense. But with the scoping paper, and um, there is no such clean version for the public. So we are a bit in the dark about how this works. Still, um, with the um, with the non-papers being circulated and the work that is being done um, or described by the different ministries, they sort of work with the baskets, but also try to not let it be too much of a constraint or a straitjacket, um, because many many um, issues are horizontal and don't um, adhere to the logic of the baskets. Okay, thank you. Um... Now, uh, one topic, and it's popped up in one of the questions here, but uh, it's about you know this term strategic autonomy, uh, Christian. Uh, no, strategic autonomy is is one of these uh, you know ever discussed topics. But uh, can you say a few words about you know yeah, is it is this formally linked to the idea of strategic autonomy uh, in any way, or is it is it is it helping us understand what it means uh, more clearly? So of course everything. Uh is linked to strategic autonomy. At least political actors who are in favor of uh, of using the terms would like to link this to it. Um, <clears throat> I think the strategic compass, in my view, is uh, an opportunity to to go to 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 get away from this more and more toxic term because it's divisive, um, and it, it's it's a way of operationalizing what the European Union wants to deliver in terms of capacities and capabilities to act. Because at the end of the day, you can talk yourself into death, um, but there has to be some some output at the end of the day. So this is a, I would say it's it's a new attempt um, to to deliver on security. Uh, whether you want to be this part of strategic uh, autonomy, yes, that's fine. But uh, the, the big gap within the European Union is that they at the end of the day come up with something that delivers uh, that delivers to the everyday life um, of security, and that's. Uh, that's the opportunity here. Um, that's how that's how I would see it. It's an opportunity to to use the terms to do compass um, and to 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 you know leave the debate behind, hopefully. Right. No, because yeah. Well, it's it's debated, and especially on the other side of the, of the Atlantic, they might be not too too you know fan about the strategic autonomy mm. so compass. I guess is more compatible. Yeah. Now, um, another challenge that we haven't talked about, which I would like to raise, is the UK and, and Brexit and Britain's role in European uh, European defence. Uh, <coughs> one way or the other, will have to be. Part, of course, the UK has to be part of it because of its resources, because of its, its uh, history, because of everything. Um, are, are there any, any thoughts? And again, asking you, Christian, um, how how the UK. Uh, uh, of course, it's a little up to the UK to define its its, its role in, in future Europe. I guess the door is more or less open, but nonetheless, um, can you reflect a little reflect a little bit about Britain? They just published this strategic review. review. Um, you know, is, is, is the UK you know setting their own course now, or, or do you think the UK will can be part of this some one way or the other? I think we have some some good conditions or uh, in the context that the, makes it possible for the UK to to get closer. To continental Europe, so to say, I guess for the UK, EU is still something that is used in a populist way to say this is a bad thing. Um, still, I guess when, when when the dust has settled over the next half year, um, the diplomats will come out of their bunkers and, and try and say, okay, let's let's try and do business again. Um, and that, that's a good thing about uh, about having diplomatic bureaucracies because they know about the long term perspectives and that there is no added value in doing things alone. So even if the UK now has regained uh, their uh, their sovereignty, as they may think, uh, there may be a kind of a, a new chapter that we can open up. Um, but for the moment, in, indeed, the, the, the problem is still the, the dust that is that is created between Brussels and London and some some capitals that um, that doesn't allow us or the officials at least, we can do everything, but the officials at least to start discussions about how to take this forward in a, in a fruitful way. At the same time, I can imagine that uh, in the NATO headquarters, these discussions take place anyway, because there are the bilateral relations, there are 
trilateral, there's the quadro format with a NATO, where I think this uh, work on the technical and, you know, technical political level already takes place, which is a good thing. So I'm I'm kind of in 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 uh, I'm I'm in good hope that that we get something something meaningful out of that uh, if we allow on all sides that this is possible. Mm. And and one more question to 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 Christian. It's about um, you did mention that uh, because your whole the main focus on the topic called presentation was maybe maybe NATO EU relations and how mm. Europe as such can benefit from these processes. Uh, you did mention Turkey, Greece challenges, uh, but in in general, what's what's uh, I mean, there are there are the, although that 21 countries that, that do have are members members of both organizations, there are quite a few that are that are not, and and like Finland, Sweden, you mentioned, and of course Norway, but others. Um, I mean, you're from your general assessment of the of the political climate in Europe, so to speak. How how, how difficult do you see this uh, this cooperation, uh, you know, in 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 reality, so to speak, over the next couple of years? Yeah, I think that formalizing it further uh, will remain as difficult as it has been over the last years. So the 74 priority areas are just an explanation of uh, why we can't make a bold step forward um, and that is that is blocked on the political level on the technical level uh, that may work better uh, but this this is formally it's not possible to move forward therefore i think the informal way and trying to uh, kind of if you can't have a let's say an integrated document or an integrated approach between you and nato having a coordinated approach makes significant sense because otherwise you're just wasting capital and there, I think we have made progress already because countries like Sweden and Finland not being former members of NATO are so closely aligned with the NATO processes. And again, here it's it's the the virtue of, of using the same procedures and using the same language in EU and NATO basically allows these countries to be informal, uh, informal members of NATO, if you want to. Um, even if there are still some limits, it's um, <clears throat> it's something where I think also because of geo strategic reasons, that was a very clever step to take this forward. And that could be the way of doing it in the same way with the regard to the European Union, because you can be as a third country, uh, be part of the projects that the European Union does. So it doesn't need to be a buy in of nature as an organization, but of individual countries that can cooperate. Uh, with the EU and with the EU countries and take the benefits um, out of the EU institutions and also the EU resources. So I think it's the informal way. We may hate this because it's it's undermining um, the institutional frameworks to a certain extent. So there's always a risk in this. And uh, being German kind of by, by nature and socialized, this is always, always something uh, I would say mm -hmm, dangerous thing. At the same time, this is the reality to a certain extent. Um, we know that um, uh, that there is a big challenge and that we are challenging our institutions from inside. It's not only the Russians who are challenging us, it's also uh, the other countries within the European Union, within NATO that are challenging the coherence and cohesion of the organizations. So this may be an, at least an intermediate step to take forward, but not to make it too bold and say there's a group of 21 and write letters in, in the name of the 21 or 22 or something like this. This may be more divisive. All right. Um, so I'll, I'll pick up some questions here from the from the from the audience. Uh, and it's Florence. Uh, there's a question here about um, uh, a bit about the process, the time frames. Is this now OK? You, you show that it will, uh, uh, inshallah, the French presidency will 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 pass this uh, next spring. But what then? What you know? Is it a living document, or is it uh, is it fixed, or is it is well? How is the process supposed to be after 2023, 22? Sorry. For now, it is envisioned um, as a as not a living document, but we have already heard, for example, out of the um, Portuguese Ministry of Defence that they think that it might make sense um, that at least the threat assessment part, for example, be revisited. Um, at some point. So there is no clear understanding of this now, definitely no consensus and no official um, talking points on this, but maybe that every two years something like the threat assessment should be revisited, especially because I think the, the first time this has been done, everyone was kind of surprised that 
um, how well this, this worked. And um, obviously it could not be agreed on everything, but um, that uh, intelligence services could, could share some, some, uh, some insights as they do with NATO in, uh, in, the, in the case of 21 member states anyway. So uh, it was not that big of a step, but in the other regard it was because for the European Union it was the first time. And um, my impression is that everyone is quite satisfied with that and this could be repeated maybe uh, every two years or so. And then it would only make sense to have some follow up if you do a threat assessment, but then do not work with maybe a new assessment of, uh, of, of threats coming from the south or the east or wherever they may be, be it space or some other domain that um, that um, that pops up, then, um, then, then there would be no use in that. So for now, it is, um, I think everyone is focusing on the next um, presidency. So it's always half a year. So this is the kind of um, time frames in which um, everyone is able to think. But um, it, it would only make sense to repeat this sooner or later, as well as with the, the, the global strategy, for example. It is from 2016. There are implementation reports every year, what is being done, um, what, uh, what, what not. And um, the last uh, European security uh, strategy then had been uh, well, more than 10 years old at the time. So um, the European Union um, is evolving into more of a strategic actor maybe, and that could come with repeating such processes and so on and so on. It will definitely depend on how successful and useful the member states will find the final product um, of the strategic compass. But yeah, so at the moment, it's it, everyone is like, is a bit excited, I think, and maybe um, looking forward to doing it again already, but we need to finish it first and then uh, we'll see whether member states still have an appetite for it. I, I noted in your in your report, I didn't mention that, but you have published an excellent report about the strategic uh, compass that yeah, I encourage all the viewers to, 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 to read. But there was a reflection there on the last basket, I think, about the, the, the foreign policy identity of Europe, uh, which I, I find, you know, good. It was kind of reflecting what's the purpose? Is it about is it about building democracy in our neighborhoods and, and, and stability through through, you know, through liberal institutions? Or is it to be helping Europe to adapt in an anarchic world? I, I, I phrase it differently because I can't recall exact words, but it was something along those lines. So making Europe a stronger actor in a tough international environment versus actually having a having an ambition of you know building democracies in the in let's say North Africa and, and other places. Uh, are these the kind of you know, these are the very deep, but also very basic questions. Uh, do you think really the compass can answer those kind of questions? Do we, are we, are we will, can we expect to see those kind of, uh, you know, that really strategic decisions being coming out of this document, Florence? Well, uh, that is a tough question you pick. Um, I don't have my crystal ball with me today, um, but yes, of course. Um, it, there needs to be the basic decision, uh, should crisis management, um, the, the missions, should they be about um, the capacity building in, in partner countries and managing external crisis, or um, does it become more and more an instrument of European defence and, and border management and um, migration control and so on and so forth. And um, sooner or later, the member states will have to make, uh, to make a decision there. Um, However, as Christian um, uh, talked about in this, what to improve the four options that are non-exclusive, um, there is the, the possibility that um, the strategic compass clings, the process clings to the institutions that are already there. And there is a sort of a perpetuation of the status quo where we don't see a lot of strategic change, a lot of um, ambition or more capability put to this. So then you would still have um, what you have today, where it's not quite clear what the CSTP stands for. Hmm. It does present the opportunity to, um, to align it in either way, but at the moment um, it is not, it, it, I don't think it's possible to tell. I don't know, Christian, if you would, um, if you would disagree with this assessment, but um, at the moment I don't think um, you can tell, um, you can expect that the member states will step up the CSDP game and um, launch 
United Nations level <laughs> peace operations um, <laughs> in, uh, in in the Sahel or uh, wherever. Um, at the moment, it is. It, it, I mean, that is definitely uh, anyway uh, not a very realistic um, outcome. But at the moment, it's. Uh, I think you can tell uh, which direction they're pivoting to, um, or not, because they. Everyone is still uh, getting warm. I think. Chris, yeah. can you want to comment on that? Let me let me add to that. I mean, the, the, the first thing is, so the strategic compass will be a success, um, and the. And, and I'm, I'm saying this because there is a, like like always, there is a process afterwards. So what we what cannot be delivered with a strategic compass can be delivered later on. It is really kind of um, a, a learning process. The, the, the strategic compass has been started very short, uh, very short term. Uh, so the preparations for this may not be there right now. But if you think it in a longer term and say that there is something where I see also an increasing interest um, by, by more capitals in Europe to say, okay, we can do something which is really worth the effort. And especially if you took to uh, look at Central and Euro uh, Eastern European countries, they may be more interested in, in asking, okay, so what's in there for NATO? Then I can imagine if you kind of extend the timeline and the perspective um, that a government say, okay, let's start with the compass, let's get something out of which, which is solid and okay, and we can build on it. So that's why I'm saying it will be a success. So we all have to agree it's a success and then we build on it and, and, and try to, to achieve what, what is called the critical path and we buy us some time into this. Um, that's, it, I would say, is, is the realistic thing. Um, those who are cheerleaders of the European Union um, of you know, stakeholders of this process, of course, have to say different things. Um, but I think that's, that's the way it could be if everybody agrees on on that, that would be a clever thing, and taking it uh, taking it forward. So what we don't manage within the next uh, uh, until until beginning of next year, we still have one year to manage it, and we can. But we need we need to prepare um, this road now. That's the most important thing, I guess. And then it's a question of headlines. You know, is it compass? Is it how you ever want to call it? Maybe a follow up on that um, when it comes to the transatlantic uh, relations and the new Biden administration. I'm just curious if have you picked up any signals from there about this process? I mean, what's, what's Washington saying about this? Is it like a thumbs up? This is great. Or is it has it been any 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 comments at all? Do you have you are you aware of that? Uh, just from curiosity. I'm, uh, and following that, yeah, okay, you can ask that first. I have a question about NATO. We can we can move into that. Um, no, I, I haven't heard anything about it. I guess Washington is still more concerned about the strategic autonomy discourse, um, but I think it's it's a good hint to to make an outreach uh, towards uh, DC and and start explaining this early on. Uh, also taking taking the lessons learned out of the strategic autonomy discussion that somewhere went out of hands, uh, at least in the perspective of some capitals in uh, in Europe, uh, to be early on and, and so show the potential is also the, the opportunity for the US to influence this process. Exactly. Um, so that, that's, that leaves us a little bit back to, you know, Norway and third states and, and you know, but before we go into Norway, there, there's one question here about Turkey. And, and since this, we have another, that's another third state. Uh, and it's a question to you directly, Christian, so I will pass it to you also. Um, just, uh, I mean, how, how, what's your assessment of the relationship between EU and Turkey? Uh, and, and to what extent Turkey uh, could contribute or play a role in a strategic compass? Um, so now I'm trying to be very diplomatic. I think that the, this, it, it's very much up to, uh, to Turkey to to define its constructive role in these uh, in this game, um, I guess nobody thinks that Turkey is an easy partner. If you sit uh, on a Turkish chair, you may find that the European Union is not an easy partner. Um, the question is whether, I mean, we, we are we are talking here about a security and a defense bubble. Um, do other concerns um, that are relevant in the European Union and its member states uh, within? NATO countries and Turkey 
do they override such an attempt or can you kind of wall fence or put a firewall around this process which if I take a look back into uh, into the past it always has been diff difficult to do this because it's it's, it's an easy pick uh, to um, uh, to spoil such an such an attempt to do something only on security uh, by throwing some you know migration issues into it uh, throwing human rights things into it and by that blowing it up so it depends a little bit on the discipline or on the do, do can we present um, this also as an opportunity towards uh, Turkey and other countries to play a constructive role and to to realign uh, with certain elements that doesn't make Syria or uh, Eastern Mediterranean go away immediately. That's that's for sure. Um, but the question is whether it can can be some some element of a bargain uh, between between capitals and say, okay, let's you know let's try to be constructive here uh, and show some goodwill. Uh, and there, I'm, I'm I'm hopefully optimistic. I have to admit that this happens. Um, if this optimistic thing doesn't come into place, I guess the, the plan B is always um, to see how you can shield informal processes against um, against attacks from those who don't want these processes to happen. Um, and Florence, I'm, I'm sorry we're jumping a little bit back and forth on different topics here because I try to have my questions and there also from the audience and I want to bring in the audience. So so uh, uh, before I go into to, to Norway, I want to end up a discussion on, on Norway towards the end, but we still have half an hour. Um, I, I would like to, to look this to discuss a little bit crisis management um, as I think you mentioned it I mean your EU battle group uh, looks nice on paper was never used um, there are frustrations uh, within Europe in France for instance that the lack of, of allied let's use it that or friends cooperation in, in emissions in Mali and other places um, so at the end of the day, it's still, as, as you also both of you pointed to, I mean, it is it's a duality here between the United States and, and EU level. And at the end of the day, there are governments that control the armed forces and they will continue to do so, no matter how many nice institutions and structures we build. So, so I mean, let's take this, this frustration that, you know, France would have more, more, uh, more support, more allies and friends uh, in, in Mali. How can this, a compass uh, help for us achieving this? Uh, that's a good question, and uh, please don't worry about uh, about jumping uh, topics. It's uh, it's a welcome challenge on this Friday morning. Um, the compass um, can obviously not um, alter any national uh, processes. For example, um, if there should be more personnel um, in the Sahel region to support the French engagement there. Um, for a German side uh, regarding soldiers, that would always require parliamentary approval. So um, even if it is a government adopted document, the strategic compass in the end, um, to actually send um, additional troops to whichever agreed upon uh, framework, um, parliament uh, needed to approve this. And um, the strategic compass has no um, option at the moment to bring in parliamentaries from across the member states. So some of the process does not accommodate all the technicalities that it needs to make it properly function in the end. But what it can do is to foster more of a common understanding because you can never anticipate everything there's going to be. But if you have an example like um, the Sahel region and um, French interests and priorities there and how they matter or don't to other member states or how they may have different interests and priorities in, in different uh, countries um, in the Sahel region or in Northern Africa, then you it, it, member states can start to, uh, to be more productive in maybe helping out each other or, or show solidarity. There was such a momentum, in my opinion, more um, in, the, in the beginnings of the 2000s, where many crisis missions were being launched and uh, where, for example, there was made use of the opportunity to um, constructively abstain because such missions um, need to be approved by an anonymous vote. But um, if 
some state could say, well, maybe that's not for me and I don't agree and I don't want my um, personnel being used there, but I agree that we need a, a European approach and, uh, and um, so I'm not going to be standing in your way, then this is something something huge for 27 member states um, to agree upon. So yes, the process does not accommodate all the technicalities that would help, for example, France um, to, to, to achieve its goals there. But that's also, it is, it is not meant to be um, a process that sh should just um, elevate fr French interests, but to bring all of the European member states together and um, also accommodate the interests of, of smaller member states or member states that are um, maybe not keen to use this one framework of their defense um, because they have more say in this one um, <laughs> than in the other one because uh, other allies are absent and have no say. Um, yeah, to, to only elevate their interests. Mm. Just a quick quick follow up on that topic, the, the French uh, intervention initiative. initiative. Um, does that fit nice? Is it, uh, you know, how, how does it, this kind of, I mean, the Brits are the Jeff uh, Joint Expedition Force, which, okay, it's not U, U, EU anymore, but nonetheless, uh, these kind of in, in regional initiatives or national initiatives, uh, do they fit into the compass or is it? complicating things? Um, it is definitely an opportunity to synchronize as it is with NATO, <laughs> um, like uh, like Christian said, and, uh, and then a good opportunity um, to also do more burden sharing. Um, obviously, the French have interests that um, weigh a lot more than for most member states, so burden sharing is maybe not the perfectly appropriate term here, more maybe regarding civilian missions where it's more or less six countries who contribute all the personnel and um, the others don't. But yes, it is an opportunity to, to align, um, but it can, it, since it is about um, what the EU does um, together, it could never make um, bilateral actions obsolete and it should not. Um, as it, it is not, the process is not designed to um, uh, eliminate the level of, of the national level in such uh, in such dis such decisions, and member states will never agree to such a thing. Mm. If um, France can use this opportunity to convince more member states um, to um, support their efforts in the Sahel and maybe show how this could be beneficial um, to, to to all of the member states then um, this could help align the approaches there. For now, um, it is difficult. The different parliaments are trying to, um, to, to, to do this, uh, um, yeah, have been doing to, to, to do this for a while now, to align French um, bilateral action more with, with, with other Europeans, be it um, in, in the whole member state level or um, uh, with, other, with, with other single states. Um, it was it's also an issue in the European Parliament, but um, it, I, I think we can we can expect no no wonders here or no uh, it, France will not stop having um, its uh, its very unique interests there and pursuing them no matter what the European Union decides. Right, thank you. Um, now let's move back to, to, to Christian and, and NATO and, and NATO strategic um, uh, concept. Uh, as you said, will be uh, we expect to, to a decision to be made in, in June uh, about this, this process of, of revising the current uh, strategic concept, which is from 2010, before, before Crimea and Donbass and you name it, and China, all that, um, long overdue. People like us, of course, think tankers have been urging this for a long time, but there were hesitation, especially with the previous US administration. Um, now, of course, we like also the think tankers and, and academics like like these documents because, you know, they, they kind of make sense. But uh, bureaucrats might not find them that useful because they're too fluffy up there in a strategic level. And that's my question. Um, I mean, still, the, the, and the NATO, uh, the NATO strategic uh, uh, concepts uh, as it is today is rather you know it is it has the three three uh, baskets is it uh, concepts three foundations uh, and it's probably going to continue it, it's my point is that it's a very high level document it seems to me that the compass will be a bit more you know concrete that's the whole point right this should be one level further down as it were 
So will that be a challenge if you're going to, you know, align these documents? Because ideally, I guess it should be the EU uh, global strategy that should be aligned with the NATO strategy. Uh, so on that first question, Christian, on that level, and don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, so I managed the technical hurdles. Um, you're pointing at, at the right thing. Can can we kind of you know compare it? I have to take a look at the at the internal notes. <sighs> Possibly um, the compass will not be on the same level as the chi concept. Um, or, or put it constructively, uh, it depends on how you perceive it and what you create in the in the meantime. If you remember back the um, the slide that, that we've made about the EU and the NATO process, there is still something where you can craft it. So I think it's very much about headlines, trying to find the right wording to generate the acceptance that the documents are on the same level. Uh, is the European Union willing to make up the, to open up the, um, the EU global strategy again? Not sure about it, but if you could, uh, if you say, okay, we do an update of this and the update is a similar update as it is for, for the NATO, then you use already the word updates. Um, and that could be that could be a way into it. And sometimes it's it's just like this, and it's just like maybe having the same people in the EU and in NATO working on these updates, if this is possible, um, to to ensure that there is a common understanding. At the end of the day, it's it's like you know, it's people working together with people to create common understanding, which is under Corona conditions a already a challenge. I have to admit. So this is. Um, this is something where the, the you know the everyday life may may be the bigger challenge than the uh, than the institutional hurdles or may even even support institutional competition if you can't sit in the same room and have an honest discussion because you don't know who is who else is in the room um, and it's very much this this social thing uh, that if we look back in in earlier times that have made things possible or complicated things. Um, on on uh, on trying to align different different views here, so I think everything is everything is possible, uh, and that's what what I learned from diplomacy as well. Um, and you can find if you reach through a proper process a common understanding of the things. Okay, let's now um, move on to Norway, so to speak. I mean, your 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 last let's say cliffhanger slide there was about, you know, Norway can be a, a bystander and an influencer. Um, uh, I can't read my own notes here. What was the third one? Integrator. Integrator, <laughs> <Or share>. yeah. <clears throat> and cherry picker. Yeah, cherry picker. So, um, so I, I'm I'll, I'll throw the question back to you, Christian. Uh, what, where do you see the most potential, or, you know, as a, where, where is the most uh, beneficial from Norway? Can, where would, if you if you were Norwegian, <laughs> so to speak, where, yeah. would you, where what would you do? I would guess I, I would have to, to dive deeper into the Norwegian uh, preference profile, so to say. Um, but I I would go for the influence of cherry picker um, because I think that not everything that the European Union may be interesting to uh, to Norway. Um, but having, I think it's good to have a very clear understanding of what is happening here and how it how it can influence Norwegian interest. Um, and it's it's not sometimes it's it's not a direct, but it's kind of indirect things uh, where things as the third uh, order effect flow back to you. Therefore, it's good to understand the potentials in there and see how how this can basically be used for the Norwegian interest. And even if you want to, I mean, it's difficult to be an integrator, isn't it? Um, um, what you, I mean, to a certain extent, I think Norway could be that. But um, depending on the on the potential rivalries and competitions that may come up, um, the question is, can you can you lead or advise by example, by political strength or by reputation, um, could could that be the the models? That's something. I mean, I have to admit, I haven't thought about it. I think that's something that is uh, there. We are on the so to say the cutting edge or the the, the the cliff, and say, okay, where do we go now from here? Um, but I find it I find it interesting to think about it because that that's a challenge for Oslo. It's a challenge for London. 
It's a challenge for many other countries that have now have to think about, so how do I do this? And the answers will be different uh, in different countries, I guess. So the, the self-understanding of London is, of course, a completely different one um, than it is in Oslo. Um, so that's kind of, uh, I guess we will see interesting times and it's a good opportunity to raise the attention to this here. Uh, absolutely, and 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 of course, um, there's a there's a one year uh, window now. Of course, these processes are happening, and it's about finding the right uh, moment and and you know what what, what to engage on and, and when, uh, which uh, which and, you know has to to be figured out. But of course, I guess from a European as a European citizen, uh, we would like more than a 21. We would like as many European countries as possible to be as aligned as possible. To, to get the most, uh, you know, in, in security as possible, uh, so to speak. Most, we can say bang for the bucks if you want to <laughs> use the American term, but it's about, about more coherent uh, security approach. Also beyond the, the kind of hard the security defense side, and 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 that brings me to uh, to, to especially the one thing that find I find a bit uh, vague is the is the is the resilience part. Uh, now, uh, as I think you pointed out, resilience is, is mentioned like 40 times in the global strategy, but it's never defined. And I guess that's going to be happen now. It's it's a very like, much of a buzzword uh, or term uh, because, but but still it is it is important, especially let's say cybersecurity and and you know and as our societies become more and more digital, um, this becomes super important as a backbone of our, our security. Both for the armed forces and for the society in, in, in general, and, and and knowing that we cannot you know pro build walls and, and protect it and prevent things from happening, resilience is the answer. Right, so uh, we will be disrupted, but we will bounce back quickly. That's kind of the, the logic. But I don't know, Florence, um, is that is there? Do you know anything more about what's happening in the what, what is going on in the in the resilience basket, so to speak? And is that an area where maybe? And it would be smart for Norway to, to, to lean forward? So, um, yes, the definition of resilience is a big problem, um, especially when uh, you stall the whole process by trying to find a definition that everything and everyone can agree to. And then when you finally arrived at that definition, um, time has run out to look at the issues and at the topics. So um, maybe sometimes it's OK to work with a, with a term that not everyone understands exactly the same things. If everyone's like, OK, we're talking maybe about um, making things robust and stuff, then maybe um, you could uh, fast forward to a topical um, issue that um, would help to, um, yeah, to, to agree on concrete steps to be taken. Since the strategic compass is not meant to have an implementation plan, but is but to be very concrete so it doesn't need any follow-up it is important to have these concrete proposals there and i'm afraid that when um you're trying to get to that common understanding it will take up a lot of time that could otherwise be used and um, talking about concrete proposals nevertheless obviously a common understanding is is important and could be um, a very important outcome um, of the discussions in this basket do I think it is um, an, it, it is a relevant issue here for 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 Norway? Uh, yes, definitely. I think it's also a good entry point because um, I would like to come back to this cherry picker um, influencer role that uh, that Christian favored. I I, I agree. And um, when comparing NATO and the European Union, um, I think Norway could look at it as in what could the European Union process maybe offer here that NATO does not. And this goes uh, a bit to, to the question regarding NATO being more political in, 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 the, in the chat maybe, um, because resilience is a topic that um, goes beyond the defense realm, way beyond the defense realm. And the European Union plays all the relevant policy fields that um, are important to resilience, be it economic or trade or the tech area or de democratic and societal issues, all of those. And this is something that um, NATO could possibly not offer in any resilience strategy. So understanding resilience as an all encompassing and very comprehensive issue, um, Norway could um, cherry pick this um, in the strategic compass process and try to influence it in a way or participate in a way where it could profit 
of any initiatives being undertaken regarding resilience um, during the strategic compass process. So it could um, partake in the, I don't know, resilience umbrella that might uh, be spanned across the European Union or something, um, but that might not be um, automatically be expanded um, to NATO. Yes, now you mentioned this, um, uh, yeah, this question here about, uh, and, and I will think I'll post that to Christian actually, because uh, in the, in the, in, you know, the NATO 2030 process, uh, basically, if you want to summarize very shortly, it's about making NATO somewhat more as a political discussion club for, for common security issues as well, not, you know, so, so we, they, they, it can be a forum to discuss what's happening in Syria, for instance, right? Don't pull out without telling us first. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but you see that, I mean, in a way that's good for NATO because it becomes more relevant as a, as a security, as, as an arena to discuss security issues among uh, allies. But how, how does that, you know, does that make it easier or more difficult for to cooperate with the European Union uh, on political issues? Um, so I think as the world has become more complicated and less less driven by military issues, I think it's the right step doing this. Um, one would expect uh, that NATO uses the opportunity uh, to discuss more similar things as they are discussed in the European Union, because then it's not only about the military side, it's about the link that this has towards the resilience and the civilian defense and civilian security sites, uh, which I think that that's the learning at least uh, since um, since uh, 2014 that we that we really have lost the, the luxury of concentrating on the on the military alone and that this uh, by using economic instruments by by using trade by using tech as instruments of politics, um, NATO has to become more integrated. So I could I could see a I could see a, a, a positive outcome because the agendas um, could be much, much better been aligned. At the same time, there is, of course, then the question, OK, who says it first? You know, who has the right of, of um, first press statements about X, Y, Z? Do we need to do things in the future in parallel? Do we have more common um, meetings between you and NATO on the on, on leadership levels, that could be some of the solutions. The other ones could, could be a blocking between the institutions again. Um, there's, there's, of course, this risk. But can NATO as such, um, and without reference to the European Union, remain relevant without going into this realm, into widening its scope? I think no. I think it's, uh, it's impossible. The core remains being a political and military alliance and strengthening the political one. Uh, and that's, I guess, would also accommodate um, people like uh, Emmanuel Macron with his uh, comments about uh, the mental state of, of NATO much more. Yes, thank you. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, as I heard one, uh, one of our colleagues from a French think tank said that we have a president that, that talk like a think tanker use the word brain dead. So I have to think that I have to explain what you meant by it. <laughs> um, right, look, there's a question to you, uh, Florence. Uh, so I will pose it to you. Maybe you see it yourself, but it's a question about defense priorities and threat assessment uh, and, and the relations, the EU relations to, 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 to China or Russia. The person is asking uh, what, what should be the priority? So that is obviously a very, very big question. Um, I think one um, very important steps in the strategic compass is to prioritize because there is so many things to talk about, so many risks to um, uh, to respond to, so many threats that um, if you try to find answers for all of them, then um, the time will be used up. You will not find any solutions to anything and everything will get compromised and washed down and you will not have clear and concrete results in, in any area. So it is a good question um, what uh, it should what should be the first step and what it should focus on. The, the scope um, of the strategic compass is security and defense. And for these reasons, I would, if I had to pick, um, 
pick Russia over China because China um, has the, the relationship of the European Union with China is a more geographically more distant and um, B has way, way more um, economic implications, for example. And there is many um, member state views uh, diverging that it's, it's 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 tougher to get everyone um, to agree on one thing. It's also something that is not um, as, as looming um, over the European Union. Um, so I think uh, if it had to be a decision between Russia or China, I would here pick Russia. Also with the implications uh, regarding Ukraine and uh, the CSDP mission there, for example, or also in Georgia. And um, there it is um, really uh, necessary for the status quo um, if when evaluating the missions there, for example, uh, to talk about Russia and the common approach and uh, how to address um, Russia as a partner and adversary, etc., etc. Well, thank you. As, um... Maybe I want to follow up on, 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 on that a little bit, because as, as both of you said, I mean, NATO remains a, a military political organization which focus on, I mean, obviously Russia and, and terrorism, I guess, is the two things. Um, but it's kind of, of course, it has the, the tools it has and its availability is, is primarily military, uh, a little bit political, but not much, whereas the main tools we, we as Europeans use now towards Russia, for instance, is the sanctions regime which is not NATO, obviously. Um, and so, so in, in today's conflicts, uh, the, the, the toolbox is, is much broader and, and the, the high end hard military is, is rarely used really, except for signaling and, and you know, and signposting and, and things like that. Um, and of course, deterrence, it has an important role there. Um, so so I, I am just now, I'm kind of uh, trying to, 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 to we go back to the question about you know mm -hmm. the division of labor so to speak between between EU and and, and 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 NATO and how how European Union can how European Union and, and NATO can kind of complement each other now of course from a Norwegian point of view the main the big fear as you know is that it should be any overlap or like you know that there should be that EU EU, EU army I think like that anything that you know could, uh, that undermines NATO. That is that is uh, that is uh, that is a red flag. So always, uh, you know, like like the UK had before, and I think Sweden and other countries had the same position. Uh, and it seems to me that, that the strategic compass is is you know well well far away from anything like that. But, but nonetheless, um, should it be even clearer somewhere that explicitly stated that NATO do this, we do that, and the compass should focus on less on a uh, it should be the military crisis management in the region, but not collective defense. I mean, just have a sentence like that. Is that, is that, would that be helpful? Would that be good? Uh, I think I'll post the question to you, Christian. Um, yeah, maybe it's, it, maybe it's good for the political atmosphere to, um, to make some statements, uh, like, like you said, Carsten. Um, I would say it's all in the books already. So if we come back to the whole strategic autonomy thing, uh, and I, it's funny because you see all the reinterpretations of this term uh, changing by the same people over time. <laughs> if you then see the language, it's it's. Um, I was wondering about this discussion because I said, okay, we had the the idea of um, the European Union being able to um, act autonomously if needed already in the books in uh, in 1996. So I was so so we are changing basically from adjectives to sub to, to, to norms, uh, and that that creates such a such a discussion. But sometimes it's about this this small changes of wordings in a specific context. And if this is helpful, I think that that could be it because I mean nobody would would assume that we do defense or deterrence through external uh, engagements. So to crisis management, we are not going to deter anybody. I guess um, we don't have a concept for deterring um, adversaries by going into crisis management missions uh, in the center of um, in the center of Africa. At the same time, the idea that future of conflicts can be divided into the state world here with the Russians uh, as a direct threat and the Chinese as an indirect risk 
to power competition uh, on the one hand, and there is the 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 world of limited statehood where we do crisis management, we empower partners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, these are two distinct worlds is less and less real. So we will see that these worlds are converging, and by that, that also the instruments that we use may our decision may converge. But if we look into what the future of conflict, if you want to, if you want to man today a, a, a conflict, a, an appropriate crisis management mission, you need your cyber defense and your cyber security team around. Whether it's military or civilian, doesn't matter. You will be uh, in a world that is fully happening in, a, in the electromagnetic spectrum with perception wars and all the things that are going on, no matter whether your enemy uh, is in Europe or is uh, in, in Africa or is in Asia. Um, so this is something where I think the, we could, we could make such statements about the division of labor. At the same time, we see that the specific tasks um, on, on this labor parts are possibly more and more converging, which then I would say at the same time makes it even more necessary to see so which modules of capability do I need? And the second question is only where do I get it from? Who can deliver best on these things? And yes, there will always be beauty contests, but that's something if we can limit them, that would be helpful. But maybe I'm too technocratic on this. No, I, th I think you have a very good point. I mean, just looking at uh, just looking at Libya, you know, with with Russian troops uh, present there and, and uh, Chinese investments and and things and look I, I will be, we are approaching the end i would like to pose a question about china we haven't talked too much about china uh and and it's uh, so it's a cliffhanger for the next event so to speak yeah no but but um because uh, florence you said that you know you would choose you pick pick your pick your russia and that that makes sense but at the same time you know it's, it's russia is a maybe a declining power and china is certainly a rising power uh and and uh a security, uh, at least a security strategy, need to kind of be mature enough, or flexible enough to deal with the emerging challenges coming from China. And Europe is kind of waking up. Uh, I would say we are, we are kind of, uh, we maybe don't want to become as, uh, in lack of a better term, hawkish as they are in Washington. Still, there is a kind of a, you know, a, a right growing awareness that China do represent a challenge also for European security. So Florence, um, do you think the, the concerns and challenges related to for, that Europe faces with comes to China is mature enough to that to be at to play a good role that that the compass will be reflecting this uh, the China China challenge sound like China virus <laughs> the, the <laughs> challenge thing that China represents uh, for Europe. Um, so as I said earlier i think due to the scope of this undertaking there is not going to be that much room to um, tackle china um, as a whole and as what it all entails the re relationship of the european union with china especially since china has been quite successful in um, playing the field and trying to um, divide member states or approach them um, one on one so um, as to lessen the power of the EU and to um, have a less um, potent um, opponent or adversary or partner or whichever way you, you want to frame it or whichever way you look at it, especially regarding from which policy field um, you're arguing from. Um, I think though something that the strategic compass could offer in that respect is that whichever way the, the European Union is planning their crisis management. If they leave uh, a vacuum somewhere, then it can be expected that China will be filling it. Especially regarding any potential future missions or present missions at the moment um, on the African continent. If the European Union does not um, have uh, the, the engagement that might be needed um, and doesn't offer it, then um, it certainly will be offered um, from other parties and also from from China. We have now seen that, for example, with uh, with the, the, with the coronavirus, um, with COVID-19, um, with the vaccines, with other thing, um, 
China has been trying to um, set itself up as a security provider in that in that health dimension, and um, also in the in, in the more security related dimension too. Um, now with, with peacekeeping by the U, by the United Nations, for example, and this um, can only be expected to intensify, and and to be scaled up, and um, the, it, it is not about um, competing with uh, with another provider for capacity building um, because the interest should be um, to resolve crisis and, um, and to, to enhance stability and bring peace, obviously. But um, it cannot be uh, ignored or set aside that um, every uh, supplier, so to speak, comes with a different agenda and with their own agenda. And um, every vacuum that the European Union is going to leave in their external crisis management is certainly going to be filled up by other actors, one of them being China. Great, thank you. And uh, just on the minutes, we are now at the end. Uh, we are now at the end of the of the seminar. So, so uh, I would like to thank uh, our dear colleagues Florence and Christian for uh, sharing their their expertise and and reflections with us. It's been really good. Uh, and interesting. I would also like to thank the audience that have posed the good questions and apologize. There's a few questions that I didn't manage to 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 bring forward, uh, but I hope you still enjoy the, the, the show. Uh, it will also be available on YouTube later on for those of you who didn't get time to see the whole the whole event. Uh, so in the meantime, stay safe and stay healthy and take care. Goodbye.